Now, um, as you know, I'm not Swiss, um, so who do I think I am sitting here talking to you about Switzerland and interviewing all these people, eating their chocolate and drinking their wine? Um, however, I do have a small claim to Swiss fame. Um, for five years, I've been working with Pro Helvetia, which has been fantastic, and I do speak three of the four official Swiss languages. I speak German, French, and Italian. Now, for me, one of the most exciting aspects of working on a project like this, on a new project like this, Literally Swiss, is that I get to explore with all of you um, the linguistic diversity of Switzerland, which is one of its most exciting aspects, I think. Um, and my next guest, Monique Schwitter, um, writes in German, is like Alain, originally from Zurich, but like Alain, she lives outside Switzerland. She lives in Hamburg. So, Monique Schwitter. Monique is one of the most fantastic writers I have ever read. She's just the most wonderful writer, and we've got uh, an extract, it'll be an exclusive extract from her new book, which is coming out in English in September, I think, we think? Yeah, I think um, so. We think, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it's not been published yet, but we've got an extract from that. And just, if you want to read up more about the authors, by the way, we've printed um, programmes, so you've got all their biographies in there. I'm not going to give you the whole list of books they've written. If you want that, go to Wikipedia. Um, would, you didn't hear me say that, but anyway. Now, Monique, you live, you've lived for 20 years outside of Switzerland. Yeah. Now, but you, you still call yourself Swiss. You are Swiss. I am, yes. How Swiss are you? Are you as Swiss as Anna? <laughs> or are you less or more? Or? <laughs> I don't know how Swiss I am. I'm just, I'm Swiss. So what makes you Swiss? Um, well, Switzerland is not only um, where I um, was as a child, it's not only that childhood um, thing and memories, but also the place where I was brought up. That's, that's the place where I became a citoyen, as Max Frisch calls it. So for me, it's very important to be Swiss, actually, in a, in a political meaning, uh, in the way um, in the way I look at politics and society. And um, as you mentioned, for, for the, uh, the past 20 years, I've been living in um, Austria and Germany. Um, so my view to Switzerland is always compared to Germany. Mm. So um, maybe it's a different view so do, do, you, do you, I mean, in a similar way, do you find yourself supporting Switzerland or Germany? In, say, say in football matches. In well, football, <laughs> Switzerland. Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting how many Swiss do live outside Switzerland. Yeah, yeah. It Why is. is that? Well, to be honest, um, when I was a child, I always wanted to leave Switzerland. <laughs> I always wanted to go and conquer the world. <laughs> and to see everything and to experience life abroad. Um, yeah. I had a huge desire to, to, to leave Switzerland behind myself. And now as um, I'm getting older, <laughs> um, it, it's, just, it's changing, Do you actually. think you'd go back? I would like to go back, yes. And, um, and now, yeah, it's, it's changing. And, um, and I feel a deep longing for... Um, oh, hello. That's <laughs> It's somebody in Switzerland yeah, phoning yeah, you that's saying, what I come right back now. now, come back. Yeah. <laughs> and is that because it's your, your Heimat? Do you call that It your... is, yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you um, it's on, on one side, it's, a, it's, like, it's a physical thing. It's like I'm, I long, I'm longing for going up, you know, and going down. So I live in Hamburg. <laughs> <laughs> You're just unable to... to um, you want to walk up a mountain yes. and down a mountain. Yes. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. a, you, you, you can't do that in Hamburg. You no. Know? There's a, maybe everyone It took you, you 20, 20 years to find out. A, but um, Hamburg, but there is just a Venusberg or the Elbberg, like yeah, it's 100 meters like this. So you go up and 
then you can go down and you can do it a couple of times, but still you don't experience it physically. So do, I, do you write? Do you write books? All your books set in Switzerland? No, no, no. So, uh, no. what what does Switzerland mean for you as a writer? Um, some of uh, all my books. Oh, I said no, no, no. But let me think about it. I think um, three of my four books. Um, have a Swiss part, at least. Yes, they mm. all, in a way, not all, but three of them, mm. I think. Mm. And the next one... This one? Uh, no, not the this, next one, one, this one, but the, yes, uh, so the, the, the one I'm writing right now is, um, yes, is going to have a Swiss part again. So, so this is yeah. your bridge back to Switzerland, Maybe. possibly. Yes. Yeah. Now, you and I, in, when we were um, debating what, what you were going to read yeah. and so on too, and we've had some wonderful exchanges <laughs> with, with the authors, because also all the, um, the extracts, the German or French extracts, and so they've all been translated. And so I've been in touch with your wonderful translator, Tess Lewis, mm -hmm. um, in the States as well. And Tess has translated um, this book that's going to come up um, in September. But we were also talking about some of your favourite Swiss writers as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you sent me through some beautiful quotes because you said that you still, that Robert Walser, particularly, and Max Frisch mm. are great um, inspiration for you. T tell me quickly about why you, 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 you still talk about them so warmly. Why are they so important to you? Um, Max Frisch um, is extremely important for me um, as a. Um, as a writer, but also as a person that I, I've seen in my, uh, during my youth, um, because um, he used to live at the Bahnhof Stadelhofen in Zurich, uh, where I arrived every morning on my way to, um, to school, to, to um, the Remy Bühl in Zurich. So. Did, did you ever meet any of the, the, the Swiss writers, Alain? Did you, did you ever meet Frisch or any of them? Yeah, no, no. Do, no. So mm. I didn't meet him. I mean, I saw him I every saw morning, him. and um, every morning I thought, uh, next time I go there and say, "Good morning, good morning, Herr Frisch," but I you didn't. No, you didn't I never. Did. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like he was he was somebody in my in my um, in my mind, and also like like a figure. I was um, a person, a character. You know, mm. I was um, thinking of, and I was I, I had. Um, some uh, imagination about um, him, mm -hmm. and, and I invented stories that uh, he was part of. Um, but also, what I want to say, um, Max, the, the, the old Max Frisch, um, sein Alterswerk, uh, is um, important for me, and um, especially the... Uh, his, his early work. No, yeah. his, his not his early, but his... His, his later work. Later work, right. Um, um, and everything he um, said about the relationship between f um, fact and fiction. fiction, between life and fiction, um, is um, enormously inspiring mm. for well, you, me. You actually sent me through um, a, a few quotes, and I'd like yeah. to read them, if I may, and then we'll hear your reading, because they are really beautiful. And they tell you a lot about Switzerland, I think, um, and then we'll translate them. Um, so Max Frisch, first of all, Die Schweiz betrachtet sich selbst als gut funktionierenden Club, der nicht kritisiert werden möchte, der nicht kritisiert werden möchte. So Switzerland sees itself as a well-functioning club that doesn't, that would, would rather not be criticised. And then, der Schweiz fehlt die Utopie. Utopie ist alles, von dem ich weiß, dass es nicht da ist. Um, Switzerland... Field. Switzerland needs a utopia. Swiss, Switzerland doesn't have a utopia. Utopia is everything when you don't know that it's not there. Jamie, are you there? <laughs> is that sort of right? <laughs> I think, you're up there, are you? I think that's probably about, it. I'll ask you later. If you want the correct translation, Jamie Bullock will give it to you in the, in the break. <laughs> <laughs> the Max Frisch trip. And then the most beautiful one of all, I think this is a really good one for this evening, the Robert Walser quote. This tells you, you, you sent me this one because you think it sums up the Swiss people. But the, the one by Robert Walser? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Do you want to read it? You read it. Um, 
And yeah, I think that's a, a really a, um, a good statement on a typical Swiss. Yeah, one that's, that says it all. Bei Robert Walser. Er nahm sein Herz heraus, schaute es an, verschloss es wieder und wanderte dann weiter. Now, do you want... That is such a fantastic quote. Mm -hmm. Jamie, I, I can understand, but if you, are you there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll just give you a quick, um, a quick translation. He took his heart out. He looked at it. He locked it away again and walked on. <laughs> that is Switzerland. <laughs> Um, Monique, if you'd be kind enough to read for us, yes. you've got um, yes. an extract from um, your book, um, it's called One Another yeah. in English, and it's been translated by Tess Lewis, and the publisher is... Angelica, the publisher... Is it Dalky? Dalky, is it, or Darf? We'll find out, we'll tell you later. Okay, Monique, if okay. you'd be kind enough to read. Um, as you, you might know, we were asked to, be, uh, to read seven minutes, with seven authors, everyone has to read for seven minutes, exactly seven minutes. That's what I'm going to do right now. <laughs> Anyone who finds herself, like me, in the unusual position of learning just moments before given a reading, that her own husband has gambled away a sum of other people's money equal to an entire year's salary, may very well choose the wrong passage to read. And so I read the first chapter, shortened naturally, because these days you can't expect book lovers to listen to anything for longer than seven minutes. <laughs> Even if the one reading is me, that is, someone who has been trained in reading out loud. It's a horrible process, mutilating your own work. First, you feed your book until it has a well-proportioned body and legs it can stand on. Then you trim off the extremities with a flimsy pen, as if you were wielding a butcher's knife. And if that doesn't do it, you lop off the nose and ears until you're down to seven minutes. <laughs> There are a few rules for a successful reading. The first is, Read what is on the page. If you follow this rule, there will be almost no opportunity for your thoughts to wander. This also applies to texts you know well, your own or those you've rehearsed already or delivered more than once. The rule does not say read what you think is written, but read what is on the page. And this kind of reading Remember those happy moments in the first years of school when reading still meant deciphering one word at a time blocks out everything else. But on this evening, I manage while reading, and I don't quite know how, to let certain thoughts that are not on the page float into my mind. Not only that, I'm watching television. That is, I see a kind of test image that wobbles slightly, but otherwise doesn't move. A host of creditors cry together, standing tall and badly lit. The picture persists, stubborn and static, but all my attempts to zoom in on and identify faces, I presume, a familiar fail. Whoever believes it's impossible to read and watch television at the same time is wrong. The test image flickers over my text, even when I turn the page. I don't even need to raise my head to stare at it. And I don't, which leads me to break the second rule. Every few sentences give the audience an attentive glance and count how many are sleeping. <laughs> Why, you ask? Anyone who has done it knows This simple procedure creates a silent but intensive dialogue with your listeners, a dialogue that draws in every last one. Even the most talented sleepers personally thank you afterwards for the wonderful reading and buy a copy of your book. Amazing yet true. But I don't dare look up, afraid that the host of creditors has spread out, not only over my text, but also throughout the room, and are looking at me reproachfully, calling out, where's our money? 
I don't know. She doesn't know, the creditors jeer. He gambled it away, I say, or rather my inner voice says, or maybe even someone else, in any case, I hear it loud and clear. Gambled away while she did nothing but watching. No, I didn't know anything about it. Give our best to your husband. You have 12 hours to pay us, or... The host of creditors falls silent, and the picture of them disappears. An unknown photograph of my two children takes its place. What are they playing at? What are my two little boys doing here? Who took this picture? When? And why? I could easily have lost my place, or misspoken, or both, almost. Astonished, I realize I've kept reading the entire time, maybe a little too fast, maybe with the wrong emphasis here and there, but without missing a beat or stumbling, that much is certain. Because on top of it all, I've also been listening to myself as I read. Someone laughs once, ha! A hint of a joke, but still it seems to work, isolated on its own. But why is chapter one the wrong passage? Because it is a love story. Because it's about a first love, which even those who don't spend much time thinking about matters of the heart recall with glowing eyes and brimming, a brimming heart. Because it's clear from this section, even in its mangled seven minutes version, that this love doesn't end happily. The next day, there's an email in my inbox, forwarded from my author's page, a stupid address, yourlook at freenet.de. Remarkably, I opened the email, I, who am more afraid of a Trojan viruses than a terror attack. You know, I'd rather miss out on something than end up with a problem. And yet, I opened the email from yourlook at freenet.de. It's me. You know who. I very much liked your reading. Unfortunately, we didn't speak to each other, but our eyes kept meeting. Intense looks. Write me if you want. I'd like that. Thank you. Thank you.